Hmm. Right, while that's cooking, I'm pretty sure we've got the whole place to ourselves because the Christmas holidays have started. There's nobody else around, which means that you and me have got the lab to ourselves. So let's talk about the salivary glands today. This is the anatomy lab. This is where I try and spend a lot of my time. I know, right? Salivary glands. I, th I thought we'd done salivary glands. I did just have to, have to search my own channel to find out what I have and haven't done. There's a couple on there. Look, I've got myself a nice, nice bench to work from and a couple of head models. Uh, that's got a load on. That's a bit more complicated. This one's a bit simpler, might be easier to see stuff. So what should we do? We should say, uh, we should talk about saliva, shouldn't we? You know, why saliva, why? What do the salivary glands do? Where are they? We should look at their ducts because they've got ducts which are interesting. Uh, we should talk about their innervation. If we do the innervation, we can knock off two of the parasympathetic ganglia in the head. Um, blood supply? Nah, it's not bother with blood supply. It's one of those things you need to build up, right? When you know where they are and you know the vessels nearby, you, the blood supply comes in from elsewhere, we'll see. Um, and then we'll talk about pathology, bit of problems, that sort of thing. What happens when, you know, patho when stuff goes wrong with these structures? Okay, what are we doing first? Well, first of all, you know that inside the oral cavity it's lined by epithelia just like your skin is lined with epithelia but it's a different type of epithelia it's still fairly tough because you put food in your mouth and you chew it and stuff um, but it's not as tough as skin so the saliva keeps the mucous membranes inside your oral cavity uh, moist so it protects them um, which in turn helps if you have an injury of the soft tissue inside your oral cavity it actually helps clotting and repair, right? If you cut the inside of your mouth, it heals really quick, right? Yeah. Um, also, it's crucial for taste, all of those things. So it's, it's, it's important in eating, right? So when you eat food, the saliva helps it makes it easier to move food around in your mouth. It makes it easier to make a bolus of food. It makes it easier to make a bolus of food that you can swallow. So there's that aspect of saliva, but you have to dissolve the chemicals in something, saliva, so that the receptors in the taste buds can detect the chemicals so you can actually taste the food. So saliva does that as well. Saliva also starts off digestion. Uh, there are serous and mucous secretions, salivary from the salivary glands, two slightly different secretions. The serous is the more watery secretion and this has alpha amylase in it. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates, breaks down starch into um, maltose and glucose. The mucous secretion is, is a mucin, it's thicker, that's the lubricant, that's the thing that's kind of protecting your mouth. Saliva's also got um, some antimicrobial features within it. It helps, it helps get rid of all the particles in your mouth, which helps keep your teeth clean. It helps coat the teeth. All of those things then help uh, reduce the rate at which your teeth decay. Uh, plaque, bacteria-based stuff, that sort of thing, right? So saliva also protects your teeth. So saliva is really important, right? Uh, and you take it for granted. So that's what they do. The salivary glands make saliva. I suspect you are onto that one already. Um, next question, where are they? Well, they are here, uh, here. Can you see that? Um, that's the same as, as this one here, and they're here. So these are the uh, parotid glands, parotid glands, um, par parotid. Right, the ear is, is, is otic, right? Anything associated with, so the ear is like the, anything associated with the ear is otic. Para, otic, the parotid gland is next to the ear. Para, beside it, beside the ear. So there's the parotid gland. Um, the parotid gland lies, well, you know, we've got, um, the muscles of mastication here, right? So we've got temporalis and then we've got masseter here, right? Masseter is your, that jaw there, that, that, sorry, that muscle there that pumps up when you clench your teeth. So the parotid gland is nestling up right up against the ear, right in these little gaps here, and then it sends a duct running anteriorly over masseter, which we'll look at in a moment. So that's the masseter, that's the parotid gland. The gland under there, right? 
that guy. See, this is the mandible. That is the submandibular gland. Submandibular. Um, so parotid submandibular. And if we look on this model here, do you see what we've got? So we've got a right, really big, big mandible, teeth. If we're looking like in the floor of the oral cavity here, that's the submandibular gland. This muscle is the mylohyoid muscle, the flat sheet of muscle that's forming the floor of the oral cavity. And the submandibular gland is, look, it's wrapping around it. Oops. So it's superior to the, the mylohyoid muscle. And it has a single duct running along here. This gland here, this is a different gland. This is a gland under the tongue. This is the sublingual gland. So parotid, submandibular, sublingual. All right, ducts. Let's go back to the parotid gland. Now, as I said, the parotid gland has a duct running anteriorly here. So the parotid gland it has quite a tough fibrous capsule surrounding it, anchoring it into place and supporting it. So the parotid duct runs anteriorly, passes out through that capsule and runs along the surface of the masseter muscle. And then at the anterior edge, the anterior border, the anterior end of the masseter muscle, the parotid duct turns at 90 degrees and dives into the cheek. So it dives through the, the buccinator muscle of the cheek uh, and then opens up inside the oral cavity. You can probably find this on yourself if you wanted to. Have a look in the mirror get a good light and have a look around and you should see the parotid papilla in the wall of the cheek if you're patient you might even see it leak a little bit of saliva particularly if you think about eating or smell food or suck a lemon or something uh, ooh, suck a lemon um and it's what is it somewhere nearby like the second uh second upper molar something like that but it's in there um now you can actually palpate the duct if you clench your masseter muscle And then you palpate up and down. You know where your you know where your ear is. You know where your parotid gland is. Can't really feel much there. If you feel the anterior border of the masseter muscle, there's mine. You can palpate. You can roll the duct over the masseter muscle when it's under tone, right? So it's a it's a real thing. It's actually there. So it has a single duct running into the cheek in that way, right? The the, 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 the submandibular gland has the same deal, right? So whereas um, a lot of the gland is inferiorly here, much of the gland is still in the oral cavity and it has this single duct running anteriorly here. So it's running in the floor of the, you know, in the oral cavity. And this is the mylohyoid muscle here, and we've got the hyoglossus muscle, and we, we talked about the muscles of the tongue a little while ago, hyoglossus, between the hyoid bone and the glossus, the tongue. So it runs between those two muscles and runs anteriorly. Also, it passes, um, it runs superiorly, it runs over the top of uh, the lingual nerve, and we'll come back to the lingual nerve in a bit when we're talking about the innervation of all these things. So the, the duct of the submandibular gland then runs anteriorly, and it, it ducts in the it opens in the floor of the mouth. And you can see this as well. If you look in the mirror, mm. the tongue is held down by the frenulum in the midline, right? Mm. Mm -mm. Now, either side of the frenulum are two openings, and those are the openings of the submandibular, submandibular ducts. Uh, and in fact, you, again, you can, if you wait long enough, you might see them secrete some saliva. Sometimes if you yawn, mm. you might actually squirt some saliva out of these two ducts. Those are the submandibular glands ducts there in the floor of the mouth. Now the sublingual gland is different because it actually has a whole bunch of ducts. What this means is that if a duct gets blocked, um, then the submandibular gland and the parotid gland are likely to have problems. And you might get salivary stones forming in these ducts, which then block the flow of saliva, causing inflammation, swelling, pain, and that sort of thing. Um, whereas in the sublingual gland, while you can get the same sort of thing to a certain extent, because there are lots of ducts, it's, it's less of an issue, right? Different parts of the gland can keep ducting into the, into, the, into the oral cavity. Okay, so far, so good. Now what about the innovation? Um, well, this is a digest function, 
so all of the salivary glands are innervated by parasympathetic neurons, right? The parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, just like the rest of the GI tract. There's a couple of tricks to it though. Okay. The parotid gland um, is not innervated by the facial nerve. It's not innervated by the facial nerve. The other salivary glands are. I'll explain. So the parotid gland here, now what we see is we see a branch of the facial nerve passing into the, fa into the parotid gland and then the facial nerve splits into five. And these five branches of the, of the facial nerve spread across the face and give motor innovation to the muscles of facial expression, which we have talked about before, which is why I was surprised we haven't done the salivary glands. Anyway, the facial nerve passes through the parotid gland but does not innervate it. It's, it's evil, isn't it? Evil. But the parotid gland is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, for whatever reason. I, anyway. Um, and what happens is, is that um, there's, there are four parasympathetic ganglia in the head on either side. And the thing about parasympathetic innervation is that you have one neuron passing from the central nervous system to often a ganglion. Well, basically, you've got, you've got two neurons. One comes from the central nervous system, synapses with another neuron, which then goes to the target. That's, it's just a thing. It's just the way it works, right? So there is a preganglionic parasympathetic neuron that comes with the glossopharyngeal nerve, it's part of the glossopharyngeal nerve, and it runs to something called the otic ganglion. And the otic ganglion is a small collection of nerve cell bodies deep in the face in here. Maybe we'll go into the specifics of that another day. So that preganglionic parasympathetic neuron in the otic ganglion it meets another neuron. That neuron that it meets will become the, the postganglionic parasympathetic neuron, do you see? And that postganglionic parasympathetic neuron then jumps onto the auriculotemporal nerve because that's coming out this way, and that's how it gets then to the parotid gland. So parasympathetic, so preganglionic parasympathetic neurons from the glossopharyngeal nerve run to the otic ganglion, synapse with a second neuron, which is the postganglionic parasympathetic neuron, that then runs with the auriculotemporal nerve to get to the parotid gland and innervate it. And that parasympathetic innervation tells the salivary gland to secrete saliva. Um, sympathetic neurons also get there. Sympathetic neurons get everywhere. They might have a counteracting effect, they might not. I don't think it's entirely clear. So parasympathetic stuff is stuff we're interested with. So the parotid gland is innervated by cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. What about the other two? Okay. Similar things going on with these two. Down here, there is a submandibular ganglion, another parasympathetic ganglion of the head. These two are innervated by the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. Um, and what happens here is that the facial nerve runs to the, the deep structures of the middle ear, that's how it runs through the skull, and then it gives off a whole bunch of branches that work their way out through foramina and fissures and cracks and that sort of thing. Now, some preganglionic parasympathetic neurons from the facial nerve run out through the corda tympani, which we might have talked about before, talked about before or not, I don't know. So the corda tympani carries the sensation of taste back and also carries these preganglionic parasympathetic neurons from the cranial cavity into the deep part of the face. Now, there's another nerve running down here called the lingual nerve, which is carrying a whole bunch of fibres from the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. It's just, having, it's just carrying these fibres down here because trigeminal nerve is the major sensory nerve of the face, right? So it's just, it, it's doing its thing, it's carrying some nerve fibres down here so it can detect sense. Now, these preganglionic parasympathetic neurons from the facial nerve that are within corda tympani jump onto the lingual nerve, 
for convenience, it's like a road, it's going that way already, so they go with the lingual nerve and then they jump off and jump into the submandibular ganglion. And in the submandibular ganglion, those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons synapse with a postganglionic parasympathetic neuron, which then runs to either the submandibular or the sublingual glands, right? The facial nerve is generally considered as the, the weepy, snotty, dribbly nerve of the face because, because it innovates, innovates the lacrimal glands up here making you cry, it innovates the nasal mucosa in here making you snot, uh, and it innovates two of the salivary glands down here making you make a load of saliva. So the facial nerve is the weepy, snotty, dribbly, dribbly nerve of the face and the head, but it does not innovate the parotid gland even though it goes through it. All right? You got it. You got it. You know what you're doing. Right, that's the stuff. That's the anatomy that's most useful for you to know about. Um, where they are, what they do, and their ducts, and their innovation, because it's tricky. Now, um, what about problems that people have now? That, that there is quite a bit to talk about here. Um, we talked about salivary stones potentially blocking a duct. So then pain might be worse when eating or might be triggered by the smell of food because the glands start, you know, the parasympathetic innovation starts telling the glands to secrete saliva, but that saliva can't get out of there. Whoa, swelling. Um, so that's a thing. Cancers, tumours of the salivary glands are a thing. They're not terribly common. Um, I think they're more common in the parotid gland than elsewhere, but... Um, the parotid gland has a famous thing associated with it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, if this gland gets infected, this is prominent in the face and it's surrounded by a thick connective tissue capsule. So if it starts to swell and become inflamed, it's very, very painful. And you see a swelling in the face here. This is called mumps. Mumps used to be a thing when I was a kid, but now because of the, there's a vaccine against it, it's not really a thing anymore, um, but mumps is caused, that's a, an acute viral infection of the parotid gland. That's why it hurts so much, because it's in this contained space and the swelling is very, very painful. Generally, infection might cause inflammation of, of these glands in general, which might cause a bit of pain. And pain around here can be very difficult to diagnose, because you've got, you've got a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of things that can cause pain. If there isn't any swelling, but there's still pain within the parotid gland because it's inflamed, it might be confused with temporomandibular joint pain, TMJ pain, right? Or it might be um, mistaken for toothache, because that's a common thing. These teeth at the back here hurt. So it's quite difficult to work out what's going on. If you, if you look for that papilla, that um, parotid papilla inside the cheek, and if it's, like, if it's red, then that's an indication that there's some inflammation here, so that helps clue you into the parotid gland. But it can be tricky to work out what's going on around here. Oh yeah, the other thing is, of course, people, when they have an upper respiratory tract infection, when they've got a cold or whatever, they might say, oh, my glands are up. Of course, they're not talking about their glands, are they? They're not talking about these, they're not talking about the salivary glands. What do they really mean? They're talking about their lymph nodes. So if you have an upper respiratory tract infection, then the lymph nodes will provide a local immune response to that infection and uh, they'll swell as a response, right? So when your glands are up, it's the lymph nodes that are swollen because the immune system is fighting a local infection, not because the salivary glands are inflamed, although that, that can occur, but that's a separate thing, right? So there you go, that's the anatomy of the salivary glands. Um, one other interesting thing, I have read that venomous snakes, that the venom glands are modified salivary glands, and that venom is a modified form of saliva, which makes complete sense. But that's cool, isn't it? Is it true? I think it's true. Just because I read it on the internet doesn't make it true, but I think it's true. Sounds good. Anyway, okay, so we're done. Um, salivary glands, what they do, the uses of saliva, where they are, their innovation and their ducts sorted. Right, see you next week. <laughs>